Welcome back to Open Line. Free financial advice tonight. Happy to have with us John Navin of John Navin and Associates. And he's given us advice on, well, how to invest, how to plan for retirement. We're talking about the market right now. Yes. Um, and you said, take your age, subtract that from 100. That's the percentage you should have in stocks. Is that right? Am I quoting you right there? Uh, the, so if the percentage, and I picked, let, let's pick a different number. So let's take 100 minus 60. So you're 60 years old. Right. 60% of your money should be in some type of safe or guaranteed investments. 40% of your money should be in stocks right, or growth vehicles. Okay. And what is safe and guaranteed? Uh, some uh, examples. All right, well, let's let's go to these buckets that we were alluding to, and then I do want to come back to the market because I want to get, um, or give, I should say, a little bit more information about strategic versus tactical and how do we invest and where do we go and what kind of strategies are there actually available. Okay, good, yeah, these, I want to do that. For these different, these different categories. So, so market strategies. If we're going to talk about then allocating money in this 60-40 rule, or probably not 60-40 rule, if we had 100 minus 60, 60% 60 of our money is fixed or guaranteed. Uh, tying that to buckets, we, we talk about four different buckets. So we have a cash bucket, an income bucket, a short-term bucket, and a long-term bucket. So the money should be placed in each one of these buckets depending upon either your age, your risk tolerance, your objectives, um, time horizons. Those are what drives how you allocate some of your money inside the buckets. And then we get more specific once we're, once we're in the buckets. But for example, cash is just cash. That's um, money at the bank, CDs, money markets, um, anything that you can get your hands on that's very, very liquid. Okay. Shortcoming with high liquidity is there is no growth. Right. And there's no interest. So there's no right. growth, no interest. Correct. Same thing. No growth, no interest. Uh, the income bucket is typically, and so if I looked at the cash bucket, let me back up a second, I say that's zero to three year money. So if you want to access some of that money that's at some point in the next zero to three years that you may need some of that money. Could be an emergency fund, uh, could be a new roof, it could be a new car, whatever it may be. If it's something in the next three years, keep that money relatively liquid and in cash and you're not going to make any money. It's just the way, it, very, very little. The next bucket we talk about is income and this is the one that we usually solve for first. Because a lot of times when clients come in and sit down, that's the one that's the most important. The income bucket should be forever. So, if you're looking at the income bucket, we, we, we look and we say, okay, based upon your income needs, and if you said, okay, I know I'm going to have X number of dollars in Social Security. Some people have a pension still. Um, all these other sources, rental property. Maybe right, there's right. rental income coming in. My income need is $1,000 a month. Okay, well, of your whole portfolio, we want to carve off the smallest amount we need to guarantee your income for the, the rest of your life. Where do you go with the income money? Could be up to the client. We use a few different vehicles. We will use um, dividend paying stocks sometimes. We will use annuities sometimes. We will use real estate investment trusts sometimes. It just depends upon what the risk tolerance is, the resources, et cetera, the clients are, are looking for. Um, the other thing that's important is to know and understand the pros and cons of each one of them. Right. And that's where people get stunned. Mm -hmm. None of these that we're going to talk about are a silver bullet. They all work together. Um, I was kind of tickled the other day because we're from Music City. Or I'm from Chicago, but I've been in Music City now f since 2007. And we all have the same notes, advisors. All have the same notes, right? We all have the same vehicles we can use. It's how you play those notes to make music. So it's how you put together the vehicles to create this perfect plan or strategy. So inside the income, you can use uh, yeah, dividend paying stocks, you can use annuities, you can use, you can't use bonds as much anymore because there's no interest, but no. You, still, you still could if you want to. Right. Um, short term buckets, we use uh, maybe a little bit more with, with the REIT category, some institutional money managers. Long term, now we're getting back to the 60-40 rule in your long-term bucket then, so if you have 40% of your money uh, in the stock market and you're going to use it for long-term money because that's your age and your risk tolerance, there's a couple different ways, vehicles you can use there. Stocks, mutual funds, um, some people use variable annuities which are pretty expensive. We could talk about that. Um, I see a lot of that, that they're really expensive. But those are the big things. So when you use. say they're expensive, does that mean you don't think they're the best? 
idea. Did you catch that? Yes. <laughs> sounds like. <laughs> Unless you're getting great value from those, but it sounds like you're saying mm, no, they're, they're these annuities. The variable some, annuities. You, variable, variable annuities. Variable annuities are okay. expensive because what they, what a variable annuity does. Um, and again, we can talk about any of these things. So if people want to talk about any one of these yeah, if there's different a question, tools, it's a call great in idea. and we'll, yeah. we'll pick them all. What variable annuities do is they have an annuity jacket, so they're offered by an insurance company. They have something called, or they have a minimum guarantee for the amount of money you put in. So variable annuities were very, very popular probably 15 years ago, and there was a, a, a good reason for using them 15 years ago because you could go to the marketplace inside of a variable annuity and get multiple managers inside one annuity. So now I can go into this variable annuity, I could buy the BlackRock fund, I could buy the Fidelity fund, I could get the Vanguard fund. I could get different styles and different funds inside one place. So then it seemed pretty good. Well, what happened is now they started adding stuff on and they have income riders now and they have death benefit guarantees. And But the big thing is right off the get-go to have the annuity company pay you or give you a guarantee on that money, they charge you 1%. 1.35 and they call that mortality expense or they call it the M&E charge. Then you also have to pay the mutual fund company inside there which might be another 1.5%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then you're paying for any kind of riders that you put on these variable annuities easily three and a half, four percent And that's what people don't think about no. so often. They don't think about these fees and these percentages which sound fairly small, 1%, but when you start talking about you're gonna make 7%, couple of those one percent charges mm -hmm. three or four you're, you're really eating into yeah. your margin and here's where you know the math doesn't add up and people don't realize this either they'll say okay um, the guy told me my broker told me I'm averaging seven percent I say okay great how long have you been there well, I've been there ten years okay what'd you put in well I put a hundred thousand okay well you should have two hundred thousand right right I only have a hundred and forty seven thousand Ugh. why well, some of it's because of fees. And then if you're drawing income off of that, now it gets really, this can get really kind of technical because if you're pulling money off of something and uh, it loses money, now it goes down exponentially and we can't get that money back. Mm -hmm. So anytime we can reduce the risk, that's something else and I can still elaborate on buckets if we want to, but uh, anytime we can reduce the risk, the better off we're gonna be. All right, I, I want to talk about market strategies. Do you want to talk about that or finish the buckets or what do, what do you want to do? Have we finished the bucket thing? No, let's go market strategies. All right, I want to talk about yeah. market strategies. So All right. you have this money, you know, you're looking at the market. What, what, are, what are some of the strategies out there, especially right now? What, what should people do now? Again, once you figure out how much you feel comfortable keeping in the market. So right. I'll put that in there so someone doesn't call me and sue me. So we have to... <laughs> we have All right, to, that's good. Yeah, so if you're out there, my caveat and my disclaimer is make sure you sit with somebody first to figure out how much you should have in the market and how much risk you should be taking. So, um, And I'm happy to sit with you, but I want to make sure that before we go too far, there right. is not one, just like we talked about notes and silver bullets, there's not one silver bullet. There are different styles. And here's what we're seeing a lot of today, and I think we're gonna see more of it in the future. Um, to set the stage a little bit, the two big styles are called tactical and strategic. Um, and in this tactical category, we're also gonna see something called passive, which is becoming more and more common. All this means is with passive investing, what people are doing is typically heading more towards the indexes. So they're buying the index, whether that be the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, the Russell 3000, um, you know, Far East, you name it, Europe, they're buying the index because most mutual funds don't outperform the index. So inside that strategy of indexing, again, becoming more popular, the other thing that is popular about indexing is the fees are about zero. Right. But you don't have to be managing it either. That's why the fees are zero. So that may not be the best way. It's a, it's a pretty good way. If somebody called me and said, I've got $10,000, I would tell you to go to the Vanguard Mutual Fund Company because they're very, very good, and I would buy a couple different indexes and just leave your money there if you had a longer-term time horizon. And again, an index would mean you buy the Dow Jones or you buy the S&P. Yes. And so I could look on the news every night and I could see oh, Dow Jones was up, which you're not supposed to do, but no, Dow Jones right. was up 200 points, Dow Jones was down. That's, that's that's my, that's what happened that day for me. 
And what the index does, the reason why it's so inexpensive is because it's all based upon market capitalization of the 500 companies in that index, S&P 500. So what happens, for example, you know, you have Apple and you have Hewlett Packard and you have these other companies that are in the S&P 500. You put in $100. The market capitalization of those companies determine the weighting of the S&P 500. So bigger companies get a bigger percentage. So let's say it's Apple, for example, um, and I'm making up numbers, but it might be 3.5%. So it might be the number one company in the S&P 500. Three dollars and fifty cents goes to Apple, and it just gets split up from there. So there's, it's just math. You put in a hundred bucks, they're going to go like this. No one's managing it, no one's looking at it. The money goes in and just sits there, mm -hmm. and that's it. So it's tied to the S and P five hundred. Okay, and and that is something that people are doing a lot now, and you think the, that's going to continue to be very popular. Yeah, because it's it, because again, eighty one percent of the mutual funds out there don't outperform the S and P five hundred, but there's ways to outperform the S&P 500. Well, let's talk about that in market strategies. <laughs> how do you how do you outperform? Well, now, <laughs> now you got to call us. So we can't. Well, you're right. Yeah, okay. no, 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 can't there, give away everything. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not. It, it depends on what you do, but there are a couple different things to, to look at. Is um, there's some companies out there that will overweight the index, and it does get into management. So you can you can take that passive passive approach by investing in the index and you'll do very very well just by in investing in the index right. you will do better than most I will say you'll do better than 90% of the population don't quote me on the statistics but the reason why you do better is because if you just put your money in there and leave it you take away the two biggest killers which are fear and greed mm -hmm. put your money in there don't touch it if you have more than a seven-year time horizon put the money in there and don't touch it but what happens is you know, as investors, we think, oh, I bought the stock at the wrong time, I gotta get out. So what do we do, we get out, right, is it at the wrong time? Oh, no, no, I gotta get back in, I gotta get back in, oh, I gotta, and it becomes this cycle. The average investor over the last 15 years has averaged 2%. The market's averaged close to six, the average investor has done two, because they let fear and greed dictate when they invest. Because we have seen some wild swings, mm -hmm. you know, some crazy days, and I think, I feel like people are more, it, it seems more um, accepted in some ways uh, for people to go in and say, I'm going to take it out before this, this market goes way down. And they're trying to manage those things. Mm -hmm. and, and you're saying that's a very dangerous. Yeah, just don't, <clears throat> don't do it. Don't do that. Because if you put 10 economists in this room, you'd get 10 different answers. <laughs> you'd have someone say the market's going up, someone say the market's going down. Someone's going to say, but if you look historically, and just follow trends, you'll be okay. But still, even though the market has been it, it has been volatile over the last several years, you think that's it's definitely there's no better place it, over the long run. Yes. To increase the value of your money. Yeah. But there's there's ways that you can do it um, in in capitalize more so on the market and reduce your volatility. Um, for example, how much time do we have? All right, why don't we take a break and then we'll give an example. Okay, I'll give an example of right, volatility like and math where it comes into play. Okay, I like that. Okay, okay. we'll take a break. Uh, if you want to call, there's the number 615-737 plus 615-737-7587. Take a break. Be back right after this.